No, I'm Jim Parker, and I'm a Also at the head table, we have the commissioner of the DEP, Paul Nelson. Uh, next to him is Ruth Ann Burke. She's the board clerk and administrative assistant. And my immediate left is Cindy Petrosi. She's the BET executive and now analyst. And to my right is Mary Sowell. She's the assistant attorney general assigned for the uh, mining rule. Uh, the first order of business, uh, Commissioner, do you have any comments this morning? Uh, Chairman Parker, thank you. Uh, board members, I just want to uh, uh, let you know how hard our staff has been working on trying to answer questions and, and get this uh, um, process moving. Uh, they've done real good work and we're hoping that they've answered your questions and we can have a productive meeting. Thank you. For my comments, I've had a lot of reading to this week, I'm sure as all the board members do, so we may have a few questions before we're done. Uh, we look forward to the presentation and discussion. Uh, Cindy, do you have any? Yeah, just on the schedule. Um, just to comment on the board member's schedule, um, the Juniper Ridge Landfill Expansion Licensing Proceeding, the public hearing on that is scheduled for October 18th and 19th in Bangor. And uh, the 18th, which is a Tuesday, will be a long day because we're going to have a public comment session that evening. Uh, and I will be giving out to you folks a um, draft schedule uh, for the hearing so you'll have a sense of when certain witnesses will be um, up for providing testimony to you. And then uh, after that, your next meeting will be on November 3rd, and that will be back here at the Civic Center. And at that meeting, uh, we'll continue uh, discussion of the mining rule and any proposed changes you might want to make to that rule, um, as well as hearing an appeal of a Natural Resources Protection Act permit. So that would be November 3rd um, back here at the Civic Center. the BEP meeting minutes of September 15, 2016 as submitted. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? You have a your stuff? What I'll do is introduce the Advanced Exploration and Mining. 
Uh, the board, as you recall, held a public hearing on the proposed rule on September 15th, and the written comment period uh, on the rule closed on September 26th. All of the public comments that were received on the rule were posted on the department's rulemaking webpage and also on the board's webpage, and uh, all of you should have received a packet of all of those comments. Uh, additionally, the transcript for the hearing uh, came in a couple of days ago, and Luthan, I believe, has provided you all with a written transcript uh, this morning, so it should be on the table in front of you. Um, the deliberative session this morning is an opportunity for members to discuss uh, with one another and with the department staff the testimony that you heard during the public hearing and uh, the information provided to you in the written comments. Um, the deliberative session, because the comment period has closed, the deliberative session is only a discussion. It's a work session between the board members and the staff and the public are invited, obviously, to attend, uh, but there are no comments from the public received at this point in time. If the board members decide to make some substantive changes to the rule in response to the comments received, there will be a subsequent public opportunity for the public to provide written comment on any proposed changes that you want to make that are of a substantial nature. Um, in front of you this morning, I've also uh, given you a packet that's got four documents in it. We're not going to go over those in any great, great detail, but there is a resource for you um, if we need to take up some of the issues this morning. Uh, the first one is just a uh, single sheet. It is an excerpt from the Mining Act, Section 490. Um, OO subsection 4, the criteria for approval, and uh, you have the entire Mining Act uh, in your packet earlier, but I will be walking through this uh, with you in a few minutes. The second item in your packet, um, I believe the second one, um, includes an excerpt from the Natural Resources Protection Act, the Section 480D standards for the NERPA. Um, as You've been um, informed before the NERPA standards still apply to any proposed project, mining project, and there were some changes to the NERPA standards regarding harm to habitats and fisheries that were made to accommodate uh, the mining issue. So that is there for us to consider if we need this morning. Um, I've also given you a uh, copy of the classification of Maine waters. Again, this is excerpts from Maine law, and uh, it's a very complicated section of law. We're not going to delve into all of it, but it does have some key provisions in it that we may want to refer to this morning because they've been mentioned by persons in their testimony, uh, including things such as the anti-degradation provision in the uh, water classification system, as well as the classification of waters class AA, class A, class B, class C, and what those standards actually are. Uh, you will recall that um, a number of persons testifying expressed concerns about potential impacts to class AA streams. And there also the groundwater standard is in this packet. So that is there for us to refer to if we need to this morning. And then finally, the uh, fourth document in that packet is an excerpt from Title 12. Uh, Subchapter 3, the mining on state lands. Again, a complicated section of law, but Lauren Parker, who's with the assistant, uh, who's an assistant attorney general, as well as Mary Sauer, uh, will be here to um, participate in any discussion and questions you may have regarding the issue of mining on public lands. So that is a resource for your use this morning as well. Um, the general outline, we uh, in discussing this with staff, we decided that the most, uh, might be the most useful way to proceed was, would be to take on a number of the technical issues first, discussions about um, the mining area, wet waste, wet mine waste units, um, tailings, lagoons, those sorts of issues, um, move to siting issues, but there could be certainly some overlap in our discussion regarding the sitings issues uh, 
uh, and the, those issues that primarily related to concerns about uh, mining and floodplains and flood hazard areas. So we want to sort of kind of deal with those technical issues first, if that works for board members, um, and then move to issues associated with financial assurance, uh, use of third party, independent inspectors, um, and some of the more procedural questions you might have about how uh, the Mining Act would work. Um, if we take the technical issues first, that may help to um, inform subsequent discussions about financial assurance uh, that you might want to have. So that's our general um, overview of how we'd like to proceed this morning. Um, with respect to the schedule going forward, um, what we are hoping this morning is that members can give some guidance to department staff on portions of the rule that you might like to see changed or have some concerns about. Uh, and in the technical area, um, we can get those on the table. Staff could be in a position to bring back uh, suggested language uh, to the meeting on November 3rd. Uh, staff does have some suggested language that may be useful uh, as they've, uh, that you may be reviewing this morning as they have looked at some of the comments received and have noted some areas where they might provide greater clarification, for example, in the rule with some wording changes. Um, what the goal essentially is between today's meeting and the November 3rd meeting to identify any changes you may want to make to this rule and the language um, that we would, and to put the language on those, those changes so that those changes can be noticed for the public because we would need to have the specific language to go out for them to provide written comment on. Our last realistic date to provide written uh, comment opportunity would be November 10th uh, because the written comment period on any substantial changes is a 30-day written comment period. And if the board hopes to uh, provide a rule to the board by the um, legislative rule acceptance end date, there's a period of time during which the legislature um, accepts proposed major substantive rules. And, if, and that end date is uh, the second Friday in January, which I believe is January 13th. Um, if we meet that deadline, then the legislature will necessarily, they, they have to take up the rule and discuss it and hold a hearing on it. Uh, the board can miss that deadline. If it wants, if it feels it needs more time to continue to work on the rule, um, but the legislature, it would be up to them whether or not they wanted to take up the rule or not uh, after that deadline. So we can see where the board wants to go, but our, our goal, as I said, is to identify as many um, changes as we can um, today and by November 3rd, November 10th, that the latest would be our last opportunity for settling on language that you would put out for written comment if we want to make the uh, legislative rule acceptance deadline. And with that, uh, department staff has been, as uh, Commissioner Mercer indicated, spending a lot of time looking at the comments that have been received. And um, I'll let uh, the deputy introduce the staff that she has here this morning. And we'll sort of begin by looking at some of the technical issues that were raised. Are there any questions for me before Melanie takes over? Thank you, Morning, Senator Parker, members of the board. Today with me are what I think are becoming some familiar faces to you. Uh, Mr. Jeff Crawford is the Policy Development Specialist for the Department. Next to him is John Kopak. He is a Senior de Geologist with our Water Quality Bureau. He is sitting next to Mr. Mark Stebbins. He is the Mining Coordinator in our Land Bureau. And next to him is David Burns. He is our Acting Director of the Bureau for Mediation and Waste Management. And today, as Cindy has said, we have come prepared to answer your questions, um, 
to walk through what is included in the proposed rule and to try to facilitate for today and November 3rd any potential changes you would like to make to that draft. And so we do not have necessarily a presentation to go through with you, but we've come prepared to be able to display things so that you'll all be able to look at references, we can look at sections of the rule, anything else that might be helpful for us to all bring up and be able to look at together. So we're hoping to have a very productive conversation this morning so that we will be able to achieve the schedule that Cindy's outlined for you. With that, I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Crawford. Yeah. Sorry, before we begin, I had indicated that I wanted to walk through the criteria for approval just as you know, background and I with the board members, and maybe I should do that before Jeff delves into the details. I'm sorry I neglected to do that, and I do that sitting uh, right where I am here. And if this is the one page sheet uh, that was at the top of the pack that I handed out this morning, and I just think of these are the statutory criteria that any applicant for a mining permit would need to meet um, so that the application that comes in will have to provide sufficient information for the department to make a ruling on each and every one of these criteria. And I will say it's not okay to meet four out of five or six out of seven. Every criteria uh, for a permit would need to be met by the applicant. And um, there have been issues we've raised related to some of these criteria, so I thought it would be helpful to just uh, walk through them before we begin on the individual uh, items. So the criteria for approval of a mining permit, if you look at the bottom of that page, subsection four is where we begin. Uh, and it says, except as provided for in subsection three above, which has to do with persons who have violations. The department shall approve a mining permit whenever it finds the following. A, the applicant has financial capacity and technical, technical ability to develop the project in a manner consistent with applicable state environmental standards and the provisions of this article. B, uh, the applicant has adequate provision, made adequate provision for fitting mining operation harmoniously into the existing natural environment and the development will not unreasonably adversely affect existing uses, scenic character, air quality, water quality, and other natural resources. At the top of the next page, there are three items under that um, indicating that in making a determination regarding mining operations effect on natural resources, that are regulated by the Natural Resources Protection Act. The department shall apply the same standards applied under the, under the Natural Resources Protection Act. And I did give you a copy of 480D, which are those standards. Um, the second, the applicant must demonstrate with reasonable assurance that public and private water supplies will not be affected by the mining operations. Three, the applicant must demonstrate that rules to protect human health and the environment adopted by the um, department pursuant to this article will be met. Under C, uh, that's the mining operation will be located on soil types that are suitable for the operation. D, uh, reasonable assurance that discharges of pollutants from the mining operation will not violate applicable water quality standards. And then it says, notwithstanding sections 465C and 470, and those are provisions of statute that govern the classification of groundwaters. So notwithstanding what other sections of law say about groundwater, discharges to groundwater from activities permitted under this article may occur within a mining area, but such discharges may not result in the contamination of groundwater beyond each mining area. And in determining compliance with the standard, the department shall require groundwater monitoring consistent with the standards established um, pursuant to section 490QQ of the, of the Mining Act. Under E, uh, the mining operation will not cause a direct or indirect discharge of pollutants into surface waters or discharge groundwater containing pollutants into surface waters. 
that's results in a condition that is a non-attainment, a non-compliance with the standards in Article 4A. Article 4A is the water classification program, class AA, class A, etc. For Section 414-A, that has to do with conditions that can be placed on licenses regarding discharges and required to obtain a license to discharge. Or 420, and 420 deals with um, certain deposits and discharges being prohibited. Uh, mercury is one of those. There are uh, some specific uh, provisions in statute regarding, for example, mercury and other toxic substances. Under E, withdrawals of groundwater and surface water related to the mining operation will comply with Article 4B. 4B, 4-D is the water withdrawal reporting program. There is a requirement in state law that if uh, an entity seeks to withdraw water from surface waters for agriculture or a variety of processes, there's a reporting requirement. Uh, and there are rules associated with um, tracking uh, water withdrawals and uh, trying to ensure the classifications are not um, uh, violated in that part, as part of that process. G, uh, the applicant has made adequate provision for utilities, including water supplies, wastewater facilities, solid waste disposal, etc. Uh, under H, um, this provision has been uh, the subject of a considerable amount of comment. The mining operation will not unreasonably cause or increase the flooding of the area that is altered by the mining operation or adjacent properties or increase or create an unreasonable flood hazard to any structure. Mining operations may be placed in floodplains or flood hazard areas as long as they are designed, and constructed, operated, and claimed in a manner that complies with these criteria for approval and the NERVA. And I, the applicant has made adequate provision for the protection of public safety. And the last uh, criterion is the mining operation will not use heat or percolation leaching. So those are the licensing standards that this legislature put into the statute. And what the department intends to do with the rulemaking is um, indicate what an applicant is going to have to provide uh, to enable them to determine whether or not these standards are going to be met and to do, decide, for example, what constitutes adequate climate So that's what your rules are trying to do. But those are the actual measurements that will have to be determinations that will need to be made before a license can be issued. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.